All right, let's give him a big hand. No further ado, Dr. Amos Wilson. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here with you again this evening and to, invite, to be invited to share this time with you. I'm uh, very pleased to hear about the think, the think tank, the uh, efforts that you're making there, Brother Maddox, in terms of um, developing a very important and needed institution in, in our community. It's interesting that uh, much of, I found that mu uh, many of us who are nationalists and nationalistic in orientation, of course, think along parallel lines and we have a certain kind of rhythm because it's a since I left you the last time I've been fully engaged in developing uh, my manual for power. You remember when I said the last time I said that I would do about 10 weeks, 10 weeks of seminars on power and how power is to be achieved and developed. I'm on the last lecture now, so we'll be pretty, pretty soon we'll be ready to uh, produce the seminars. A major part of those seminars, I decided I'd write out the lectures first, so that's why I have postponed them until I finish the lectures because I've looked at power and a number of its bases, the, its economic bases, cultural bases, uh, how it's based and related to the family, uh, and in, in a number of other ways so that we can be very clear as to how we can develop power and use that power in our interests as a people. One of the longer sections that I worked on had to do with the think tanks and the role of think tanks in the organization of power. In fact, I review quite a few of the think tanks used by the ruling class in this country. And as a part of the seminars, we will go over those think, uh, think tanks, look at how they operate, what role they play in the society, how they form a major part, in fact, the central part, of the ruling class policy formation network and the ideology formation network. How you move from the think tank into the universities, into the seminars, float the ideas into the media, use the think tanks to create expertise, and get the experts located in the government so that they actually begin to turn ideology into policy. I deal then with power, of course, I deal with it not from the point of view of how we are victimized by it, but how we ourselves are going to use it in our interest and use it in a positive manner. So a good deal of the lecture deals with how we ourselves will organize our think tanks and how those tanks are related to the network of structures in the African American community. We are looking at um, Chancellor Williams' master plan and using that to bounce off of in terms of ultimately creating a nation within a nation. And based on the concept of nation within a nation, we want to create the kind of organizations that would permit us to overthrow the European nations and the European systems. You must keep that in mind. If that's not your goal, you're not about power. If that is not your goal, you're really not about education. You see, what do I say? The function of education, first and foremost, is to maintain the biological survival of a people and to advance their interest, to defend their interests and their very lives, and to enhance their quality of life. If your education does not function in those terms, then it is miseducation. 
It does not matter how much knowledge you have accumulated, how competent you are in terms of your skills and so forth. If you are not able to f defend your very biological life, to defend the life of your people and advance their interests, then you have been miseducated. See, and we have to, we have to recognize one thing you see here. As I spoke earlier today about the uh, ideology of individualism, where, uh, and a part of that ideology has a, a thinking of education as individual salvation and has us thinking that education basically is primarily functional for the individual, for the individual to get a job, for the individual to qualify. So each of us is going to make his or her own individual contract with the system that dominates us. Each one of us then thinks that we can engage in individual salvation. This is destructive and will lead to the destruction of African American people and African people. We will die with tremendous amounts of knowledge and skills in our heads. If those skills and if the knowledge is not coordinated and combined in the sense of nation and in the sense of peoplehood, no amount of individual accumulation and knowledge and skills will save us as a people. It is only when that accumulated knowledge and the accumulated skills that we have are coordinated under the banner of nationhood and peoplehood will we then save ourselves as a people and we will be saved individually as persons. We must keep this in mind. So, uh, it's a good thing that uh, we're doing the think tank here. And it's a good thing that shortly thereafter, I think my own work and the work of those who support me will be out supportive of that idea. Uh, we just want to announce quickly here that Brother Monk is back there with a few of the books. If you care for any of them, those of you uh, who are not familiar, with what we're doing here, you have to recognize we now have four books out, The Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, Awakening the Natural Genius of Black Children, Understanding Black Adolescent Male Violence, which is a companion book to Black on Black Violence. We are trying to put together here then a set of books that are connected one with the other. These books are not being uh, published individually, they're really being published as a unit so that we'll be able to move from childhood as in the developmental psychology of the black child right to the book that will be published later on in the fall, Educating Black Children for the 21st Century. Thank you. This evening, we're going to talk a brief bit about education and a little bit about so-called special ed, even though I'm not going to go into detail about that uh, at all. I'm going to sort of use learning disabilities as sort of a paradigm in terms of education. I try to urge people when we talk about the problems that confront us that we must talk about them within the context in which they occur. It's very important that we begin at the beginning. Too often people begin to discuss problems and issues too late in the sequential chain of events, you see. Instead of starting at the beginning, they will start on the third or fourth link. And despite their good intentions and so forth, they will often arrive at the wrong conclusions uh, because they have not started at the right beginning here. As I have pointed out in other, kind, in other assemblies, we must start with the fact that we are a dominated people. That's very important that we keep this in mind. I am beginning to urge now that we start to discuss domination and the psychology of domination. And we focus on that because it will permit us to see many problems and issues and to predict many events in the future. I, I suggest that we engage in that before we engage in the discussion of racism. 
because racism is a secondary quality of domination. It is an instrument of domination. The first thing is the desire to dominate. The second thing is then to choose the instruments of domination of which racism is but one. There are a number of instruments of domination and we, we're going to go through those in our seminars in terms of the various forms of domination and the various means by which domination is attained and maintained. Look at domination. Recognize, as I have said in other assemblies, that domination is a social problem. When you say that we are dominated or that we are dominated as a people, we are saying that we have a problem. You cannot be dominated without having a problem. You cannot be, as we are, dependent on another people the way we are at this point without having problems. We cannot be vulnerable to annihilation and genocidal destruction without saying that we have problems. And when I talk about then our people being dominated, I'm talking about not only are we under a system which seeks to control our behavior and its interest, but we are also in a system where we are greatly exposed to genocidal destruction because we do not have a countervailing power to defend ourselves as a people. At this point, our lives hang on a thread if the United States and Russia and other nations were to combine their military and other forces against us, we must ask ourselves what African nations and people could arise in our defense. That's why I've told you earlier that a part of the education of our children must be an education into military strategy and must be an education that ultimately leads to our capacity to defend ourselves militarily. What did we say about the major essence of domination? That this society, though it rewards us, this establishment, though it rewards us, to maintain its control, if necessary, will kill us. And you must keep in mind that the European never, 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 never intends to give up control of African-American people. Never intends to, to not be in a position to dominate us as a people. Never. And if it is necessary, and we've seen it already, we see it every day, for those people to kill us, to maintain control, they are going to engage in that. You keep that in mind. Because see, there are some of those who are being rewarded by this system. You see, and they, they see themselves being elevated in it. And they think, therefore, it is changing, and its nature is changing, and its program is changed. You manipulate both through reward and punishment. So people who want to manipulate and control others may at times reward those they want to control, and if necessary, destroy them on the other end. So you cannot assume because you're being rewarded by this system or promoted in it or given some so-called new liberties and so forth that this means that the system is becoming soft and is changing its whole uh, drive, focus, and purpose. Not at all. The purpose and focus of this system remains the same. And that is to maintain white global supremacy. And we have to keep that in mind. How many people have, see, have uh, seen a series of programs with Derrick Bell? Derrick Bell, the uh, Harvard professor, used to be? Yes, constitutional lawyer, taught constitutional law at Harvard University. Who, yes, Donahue, he's been on Donahue, uh, the gentleman on Channel 13, Charlie Rose. Uh, on this, the gentleman that comes on Saturday during the day from Rutgers University, there, I forget his name at the moment. And you see this thing again and again. He has a current book out called Faces in the Well, of, of something of that nature. And of course, we are supposedly the ones in the well. <laughs> uh, and it's interesting because he, his subtitle is something like The Permanence of Racism. 
And the thing that these white liberals start agonizing over when they talk about him, talk to him, and it's interesting to watch them, isn't this a statement of despair? Aren't you now just giving up, they tell him? When you say racism is permanent, you know, how can then you encourage black people? And of course, he struggles with it as best he can. And he's to be congratulated to have moved to that point where at last, after 30 or 40 years of assimilationism, he recognizes that the white man is not going to change fundamentally. So he's to be congratulated by that. And he says that every time we get a, a step forward, the whites figure out another way to negate it. 30 years, 40 years to realize this. But he got there. Now he needs to make the next step, which is the step toward revolution. Yeah. But he's afraid to make that one so far. And listen to the title, The Permanence of Racism. And the reason why the white liberals agonize over it, the title, is the way they read into the title. That is, they read the permanence of white racism. But he says what? The permanence of what? Racism. And apparently he himself tends to think that. But who says white racism is permanent? Why does it have to be permanent? You understand? The statement is not a statement of despair. It's a similar kind of statement that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad made. That the white man is what? Your natural enemy. Yes. Yes. That's not a statement of despair. That is a declaration of war. Yes. When you recognize that this man is your natural enemy, that this man is habitually and innately racist, that means then you got to give up the hope that he will ever be transformed and you re must remove his capacity to practice his racism. It means you must educate yourself and organize yourself to bring it to an end. On the other side, too, if you're going to say racism is permanent, it recognizes then that even other races will seek to dominate us and to control us. So if racism is permanent, then let us make sure that we as a race are on top of the heap. Oh yes, if you say it's permanent, then you better make yourself in a position where you won't be affected by it. But you see, you didn't want to understand the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You, as soon as he mentioned racial superiority, it frightened you to death. I saw more people get excited about the idea of black superiority than they ever did about white superiority. So on two levels, we must deal with, with racism and must recognize then if it is permanent, whether it's white racism or any other kind of racism, the African American community must develop itself to defend itself successfully against the racism of other groups. And we're gonna to get to that. When you make that your goal and your purpose, it revolutionizes your approach to education, to socializing your children, to organizing your community. When you are filled with the feudal hope that some day, some way, these white boys and little white girls are gonna hold hands with little black boys and little white girls. That kind of wishful thinking is gonna retard you mentally, socially, and economically. When, Brother Maddox, you're talking about thinking, and it's very important that you're putting the emphasis on that, extremely important extremely important. Thinking is the greatest threat to the European. The greatest threat of all. One of the forms of thinking, and, and in, in educating the black child for the 21st century, I go through a whole series of thinking styles and I lay out why those thinking styles had to be repressed in African-American people. 
and the economic and social political role that they play in their repression in maintaining white supremacy. And I named them one by one. Why uh, do we have problems with conceptual thought, abstract thinking, thinking in analogies, hypothetical thinking, understand, logical kinds of thought? It has nothing to do with academic issues in this fundamental basis. It has to do with maintaining political dominance. And this just shows up in the academic setting. And we misinterpret it as an academic problem, you see. Hypothetical thinking, let's look at that quickly. Thinking in terms of the as if or the what if. You see a lot of our people back off of that immediately when you say, well, what if? Let's, let's act as if. Oh, no, 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 we want to deal with the concrete. Let's deal right now with the thing right in front of us. You see, this is exactly the way people want you to think because it is reactionary. It is a kind of thinking that waits until the disaster has occurred before the individual can engage in action. It, it's not the kind of thinking where the action can be predicted far in the future so that the individual has time to prepare for it. But you see, that's what hypothetical kind of thinking will allow. See, for one, to prepare and to prevent, you see, and to forestall events. But when you make people think concretely and think reactionarily, the event is already occurring. And one of these days, that event will be our annihilation. We won't have time for protest marches. We won't have time to petition the Supreme Court. We won't have time to do the kind of things we're doing because it'll be happening right to us right then and right now. However, if you study domination, you can see its development and see where it's going long before it gets there. If you act on the what if, the hypothetical, you can prepare for coming events and be ready for them when they occur, or you can go to meet them and block them before they even get started. Yes. I've told you before, there are those of us who are very interested in discovering conspiracies. And that is very important to discover conspiracies. But often, ladies and gentlemen, when you have discovered the conspiracy and the conspirators, it's already too late. They're already on you. What you study is the capacity of those others who can destroy us if they choose to do so. What you look at is what? capacity to do, not intention to do. You see, you see, we'd rather let the white man and other people have knowledge of AIDS and germ warfare and chemical warfare and all of these things, as long as we don't detect in them an intention to use them against us. And then we are going to go into action as soon as we discover that they have an intention to do us in. At that point, it's too late. It's too late. As soon as we discover who the conspirators are, let's dig them out and see where they are. At that point, it's over. You don't have time to prepare to deal with germ warfare at that point. You don't have time to deal with chemical warfare and stuff at that point. You understand what I'm saying? What you must look at is what are these people capable of doing if they choose one day to do it. I'm not worried about whether they intend to do it whether they are conspiring to do it. All I know is that they are capable of doing it. And for a reason I may not foresee, they may decide one day to what? Do it. And it's the fact that they have the capacity that is going to motivate me to develop a defense and an offense against them. Yes. This is where you go with hypothetical thinking. And you lay out a lot of ifs and propositions. But you see, a lot of us start going to sleep. You know, you're talking theory. You know, you, uh uh. This theory is the greatest reality, I'm telling you. Theory is concrete. You see? Why? Because you're in a win win position. Right? In this situation. If they never use it, you're okay. 
you don't you haven't lost anything have you if you have been prepared that if they should do it you're also okay because you're in a position to defend yourself against it you see so when you operated on the hypothetical and prepared in terms of the hypothetical you win either way whether they never get around to it or if they do being able to do what successfully defend yourself against them when they do or before they do but if you sit around and wait to watch and see wh if, when they're going to do it or wait until they do it at that point you had a strategic and tactical disadvantage and you will be overrun as a matter of fact being prepared to deal with them often is the very thing that keeps them from making their move but in order to do that you must develop appropriate forms of thought you must develop a kind of abstract thinking that removes you from the immediate world into the distant future and you must be able to organize current behavior social relations and institutions in terms of the distant future you understand and therefore abstraction which removes the individual from the immediate circumstances and propose, makes propositions about the future then becomes the foundation for concrete action. It's not just a playing with ideas. It is the vehicle for concrete activity and preparation. But you see, in order for the Europeans to control us, in order for the Europeans to keep us constantly off of balance, in order for the Europeans to be in a position to launch a surprise attack against us, they must repress hypothetical thinking in African American people. They must make us uninterested in hypothetical thinking. They must make us devalue that kind of thought and devalue people who engage in it. You see? And therefore, as I will talk a little later on, the whole social system is organized to destroy these kinds of thinking styles in African people. White paternalism said, look, you don't have to worry about the future. We're going to take care of that for you. So why, you don't need to project into the future. You're not in charge of your future. Therefore, you don't need to, to organize for it. You see, what did we said before? Why are so many of our people caught up in immediate gratification? Why is the attention span of African people so short? Of course, it has to be short, you know, so that we can forget all of the atrocities committed against us in the past. So that we can forget immediately, two weeks later, every insult that has been visited upon us as a people. And yet you see other people keeping memories alive and sometimes not getting their revenge until three and four and five hundred years later because they don't let their history die. But here we have a people for a hot dog and for a cup of coffee at an integrated lunch counter are willing to forget every insult to their ancestors that ever happened. What does it mean then, the loss of memory by African American people, the shortness of the attention span becomes politically and economically productive for those people who've destroyed their memories in the first place and destroyed their ancestors. When you get a people then who place their faith into, in, in, on, in their enemies, and see their enemies as the creators of the future, they will not develop abstract thinking and develop uh, behavior in terms of future projections. They will leave it to the others. And you know what I said, you know, we are always in wonderment. Lord, what are they going to do next? You know, what are we going to do next? That becomes the issue. Not what are they going to do next. And, and so we will show how many of these thinking styles are designed to maintain political st uh, stability of white supremacy. So what do you have here in the African American mind? A mind that has been made bereft of its past. And you see, it takes abstraction to also visit the past, doesn't it? 
In other words, in order to deal with the past, you have to leave the immediate circumstances and return back to a time that no longer exists in concrete terms. Think about that past, draw knowledge and information from that past, draw wisdom from that past, draw all kinds of conclusions and inferences from that past, and use that, the past experience, past knowledge, and all of these things to deal with current and future problems. But when you let another people destroy your interests in your past, in your past experiences, in, the, in their past as well, then you lose concrete coping skills and possibilities. You cannot bring to bear many things that have been already generated and use them as tools for confronting current problems and future problems. It puts you then at a disadvantage uh, 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 in the face of people who have long memories and who look at their past constantly and consistently and who keep re-examining that past for lessons and principles and methods and so forth that they use to defend their interests and to advance their interests. Therefore, they, de they must develop in their children the capacity to abstract themselves from immediate circumstances and to project into the past and take from the past those gifts that the past have to offer so that they can take those past experiences and take those gifts and recombinate them into new syntheses and to create new combinations of possible solutions to solve the problems that confront them. But when you want to keep a people imprisoned, you make them forget their past. You must understand that identity and consciousness is a part of a grid of coordinates. We locate who we are and we identify who we are and what we are in relationship to other points in mental space. We know who we are and what we are by comparing ourselves to where we have come from and where we are going and how we are related to various other important points in time. But when you have lost your past and lost the history of your past, you don't know why you are where you are, how you got to where you are. You don't even know where you are. <laughs> and you don't know where you're going. And you don't know who you are. Because identity rests in a sense of continuity. That there is something in me that has existed and continued from the very first day of birth. And I use that sense of continuity to say who I am and what I am about. And therefore, when a people lose that sense of continuity from their birth and through their history, they lose a sense of who they are and what they are about. They cannot locate themselves in time and space. And a people then who are not determining where they are going also have that same problem. And so what have we done? We've let the Europeans steal our history from us. And we've let the European also steal our future from us. And then we complain about our children and ourselves being caught up in immediate gratification. But what else can you be caught up in if you have no future and no past but the present? And so consequently, children, our children in these schools confronting academic and other problems which requires that they use abstraction, which requires that they project a purpose and organize their thinking and behavior in terms of that future projection, which requires that they look back and see what information is already available and how that information can be utilized to get them where they're going. When a people have been robbed of their history, of their past and their future, they will have children then who will have problems in the classroom situation which demands this kind of thinking. You understand? That's why, ladies and gentlemen, if you are to solve the academic problems of African American children, you must solve the political and economic problem of African American people. 
you must solve the problem of being dominated by Europeans because that domination will create and shape your thinking styles and thought styles and behavioral styles and emotional styles. You have to understand that. I wish we had time to talk about some of these things. There's a lot of confusion around here. We, we, we got some African people around here want to identify thinking imprecisely as an African form of thought. Oh yes. And they want to tell African people that we are only an intuitive people. And that we are only satisfied with approximate thinking, not precise thinking. Don't fall for that baloney. First of all, the study of the history of Egyptian civilization and our other civilization will get you off that kick about African people not being precise. Okay? Be very careful. Do not paint European stereotypes of African mentality in the red, black, and green. Okay? Oh yeah, because we got some people who are running this kind of game. When it comes time for hard, straightforward, precise thinking, logical, critical analysis, we have some jokers that says, well, you know, African people are an intuitive people. So, you know, we're just going to what? Intuit this. <laughs> Come on. You got two sides of a brain here. You got a left side and a right side. And you must use them all. Well, you know we are an emotional and a feeling people. What's that nonsense? Because it is through our emotions and our feelings that our enemies manipulate us. Yes. In order for us to be dominated as a people, we have to be predominantly emotional. And we have to be predominantly guided by feelings. You see? And not know when feeling is appropriate and intuition feeds the thinking process rather than intuition totally dominating the process. You cannot make them. African people are intuitive and precise. We are nonlinear and linear thinkers. You understand? We are concrete and abstract. The essence of African education must ultimately mean that we become bicognitive, which means that we use both sides of our brain. And we use them appropriately. Don't come telling me that we only have one form of thinking, you see, and that we cannot acquire other forms of thinking and that we should not acquire other forms of thinking. Uh-uh. That would mean that your creator then has built in a disadvantage, an adaptational disadvantage for you that says now that you face a group of linear thinkers you face a group of people who think abstractly and conceptually and who use that thinking to develop weapons and means of manipulating and controlling you, you being an African should not or cannot develop the kind of thinking necessary to block their intentions. Mm -mm. No, no, no. We're not buying that. We're going to think intuitively when it's productive for us. And we're going to think conceptually and abstractly and linearly when it is also productive for us. I've given you an example, haven't I, of the Star Trek situation. Remember, Star Trek is a, is a good example there. We have Mr. Spock, the linear thinker, half man, because he has no feelings, no human qualities but he's analytical and objective and thinking, and that gives him certain advantages, but he's still not fully developed. That's European man. Then we have Dr. Bones, filled with human emotion and pathos. 
But that places him often at disadvantage because he's too overrun by feeling and emotions. He cannot detach himself at, right, at, at, at appropriate times from his feelings and his emotions. So these two people are the helpmates of Captain Kirk, who is what? Both objective and feeling. You see? He's able when necessary to detach himself and analyze and critically work with the problem. And at other times to allow his feelings and intuition to operate. That's why he's the captain of the ship. And therefore, African men and women, if we as African people want to be captain of the ship Earth and captains of the universe, we will let the other people be one-sided, left brain only or right brain only. We're going to use our whole brain. <clears throat> An African-centered education is whole brain education. And uses them appropriately. So let's, 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 we have to recognize at the center of African-centered education is not only the education into culture and history and so forth. That's extremely important. Because culture is also a way of thinking. More than anything else, culture is a way of thinking and of conceptualizing the world. Not just a way of dressing, a way of dancing, the ways of rituals, that's a part of culture, yes. But on a fundamental level, culture is an intellectual system. It is a system by which people comprehend their world and solve the problems that confront them in their world. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when African people reclaim African culture, and reclaim their identity and consciousness and reclaim their intentionality to be free of any domination by anybody. You will see an intellectual and creative explosion that has only been equaled by Egypt in the past. Because we got the mind for it. We got the brains for it. But let me quickly move on here. I, I, I'm always running over time. But we'll just, we'll run quickly through the presentation here this evening. Remember though what I'm saying? Domination is a social problem. Domination creates social problems. Those who dominate benefit from their domination. Keep that in mind. Therefore, they have an investment in perpetuating the problems generated by domination. Okay? You must keep that in mind. Then you will never be surprised why these programs white people propose never work out. And no matter how much they talk about education, it never works. No matter how much they talk about crime reduction, it means we end up in jail. Why? They have never solved the problem. Because they have a what? An investment in maintaining the problem. Our problems are sources of their political and economic domination. You understand? Some gentleman called me one day when I was on Gil Noble show a few weeks ago. And uh, he said, you know, I got a movie, and he was looking for support. And he gave me a scenario of the movie he had that was going to present a real uh, uh, nice black adolescent who was doing good things in the world. And he was saying he couldn't get any support for that, you know, because he wanted this young man to represent, you know, a positive image and perhaps to persuade other people that we weren't all bad. 
and to, to, to provide a model for other black adolescents. And, you know, that's, that's reasonable and that's a credible uh, thing. But, of course, the thing that he ran up against was the fact that he didn't get support from those people in Hollywood. In fact, one or two of them told him, look, we want criminal black young men images. You know, right, come back and bring us a movie about black criminality and so forth, then we'll fund you. Why? Because the image of the black criminal is worth millions of dollars in Hollywood. Billions of dollars. Right? When you project the young black male as criminal, you can fill the theaters. And the people who fill the theaters first are whom? Black folk. Black folk. Along with the others. So you know these people are not going to give up that image. It's worth billions to them. You understand what I'm saying? They are invested in that image. That image is worth what? Money to them. I was mentioning today, if you look at this month's Essence magazine, the first fold that you will get after the first page is a nine-page spread that folds right out of the magazine. Nine pages. Full color. Do you know what a full page, first page in Ebony magazine will cost you? Close to forty to $50,000 per page. And you thought that was a black magazine, didn't you? <laughs> there is no black magazine out here. Essence magazine represents the greatest economic triumph of white folk among black people. The articles are just put in there for a little variety. Economic structure. The articles are in there merely for variety. And that is why you're not going to find any revolutionary articles in there. That is why you're going to find Emerge magazine writing about Dr. Jeffries and not permitting him to write in it so that they can control the concept of who he is and what he is. That is why in the Emerge magazine they will pretend to speak to real issues but they make sure they're edited it in a way that they will not insult those white advertisers. And if they deal with a strong issue, you will see the lead editorial on the first page trying to kick down or reduce the possibility of reaction. Look at it. You're going to tell me Ebony Magazine is a means by which black businesses can move forward? You're out of your mind. One inch of that magazine will cost you $1,000 and $175. One inch, a one inch column piece. Black and white page will cost you around twenty-five dollars or $30,000. A full color front, uh, uh, first page in the magazine, four colors, $50,000. And you think that's your vehicle to, to get to the black market. You're out of your mind. <laughs> so when you look at Essence Magazine with that nine-page fold, and I don't know what their rates are, I was afraid to ask them. After I asked Ebony what its rates were, I thought I was going to advertise these books in it. Forget it, <laughs> you know. But even if Essence sells one full page for $20,000 a piece, you're talking about an advertiser that's paying a minimum of what? $180,000. Okay? Now, if those were ebony pages, you're talking about what? You're talking about, uh, what, nine times 50000 $450,000. You know Johnson is not going to rock that boat. Don't you know, ladies and gentlemen, that it's so-called black success that imprisons us? When that success depends upon the patronage of other people? That is why Ebony Magazine, for Ebony Magazine, many of the problems and issues that Emerge pretends to deal with, doesn't even, it, it pretends they don't even exist. It can't. And when you turn this Essence Magazine this month, 
you will see one cosmetic ad after another. One right after the other. Every, almost every page. Beautiful ads. Benson and Hedges. A full page golden pack of cigarettes. Beautiful picture. Yes. And a part of this game that told ladies, you have come a long way, baby. And try to make them identify freedom with enslavement by saying that if you enslave yourself to a smoking habit, it means that you are free. <laughs> so you will symbolize your freedom by becoming addicted. But this is the kind of game. This is the way this system must work. I've told you before. What? In order for this system to work, black people must feel freest when they are what? Most enslaved. Yes. And we must see our enslavement as the essence of freedom. And we look at our magazines enslaved to white advertisers. And we see that as freedom of the press. You're out of your mind. It won't happen. Why are so many cosmetics ads there? And why has Revlon gone into very special research to deal with the black skin? Oh, yes. Yes. You understand? But you must recognize that blacks who are what? 12 or 15% of the population are buying 40% of the cosmetics. All right? And a good deal of why we are buying those cosmetics is because we are uncomfortable with who we are and what we are as African people. We have a problem with our natural African beauty. And this industry makes tons of money, enough to invest from $180,000 a month to a half million dollars a month in that problem. And they got to earn their money back and more. So consequently, it is not in their interest that black people never have a problem with their African selves. It's too valuable. Understand what I'm saying? And we can go on with one problem after another, and I can demonstrate to you any problem that you can name that African people have is an economic, political benefit to Europeans, and they have an investment in maintaining it. And that also involves the problems we have with thinking, the problems we have with education, the problems we have with behavior, and any of the others you may name. You must, keep, if you keep these principles in mind, then it will become very clear what's going on. The system, in order to maintain its domination, must generate problems. It must perpetuate those problems. That's why, in the end, you've got to destroy it. You see, there are some of us who think, and who think that I came here tonight to talk about re how you rehabilitate learning disabled children. Are you kidding? I told my class, and I have a class over there, children at risk. As I know you expect me to come up here and write on the board the characteristics of the children at risk. They behave this way, they look this way, they think this way, you know, and they come from this kind of family. Forget it. Forget it. I didn't come here to, to do that. The first thing I come here to ask you is, what? Who put them at risk? That's the number one question. These are children. Why are they at risk? This is the thing you got to ask. You see? Who benefits from them being what? At risk. You see, but you get these decontextualized white books and these approaches, they will start with the child as it is and with the symptoms that the child presents. And then it's, they'll get you into a remediational psychology. How do you cure them after they get the problem? And I told my class, I'm not going to sit here and lay out a lot of remediational approaches either. Mm -mm, that's not the first thing I'm going to do. 
You know why? Because if you had a remediational approach that was picture perfect, that worked 100% of the time, let us propose that you discovered a method of rehabilitating learning disabled children that really worked. So 100% of the children came in, that went into the program, came out abled. Would that solve your problem? The problem isn't solved. Because you are working with them when? After the problem has occurred. The system that is generating the problem is still doing what? Generating the problems. And even though you may have the perfect system that operates once they get in there, the system is going to be generating them so fast they're going to overrun your capacity. And all you can do, we need more social workers, we need more psychologists, we need more school discipline, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you'll be run over. So the deal is then, while we will look at remediational approaches, we must ultimately look at preventative approaches. We must nip the problems in the bud and we must prevent and knock out that generative machine. Yes, we must destroy the generator of the problem. But you can get so caught up in remediation and dealing with the problem until you forget to block it at its source. And the generator of the problems, ladies and gentlemen, is the power differential between African American people and European people. That problem flows out of our relative powerlessness. These people generate these problems because they have the power to do so. And we can prevent them from generating these problems by neutralizing their power and their capacity. That is why then when we study children at risk, we don't sit around and do a whole menu of characteristics all the time. We are busy developing strategy to end the generator and to destroy white power, which is the generator of the problem, and destroy white supremacy, which is invested in the problems, and even invest itself in the remedial programs, by the way. You see, what do we say here? We have a system that generates the problems, and then it pretends that it's got the method for curing it. So it profits on both ends. It profits by generating the problem and crippling the mentality and behavior of our people, crippling our communities, crippling our power as a people. And it makes tons of money, as I have just indicated, by doing this on the front end. And then it comes around the back end and pretends that it's got a solution to the problem. And it sends then its agencies and humanitarian workers and helping professionals who didn't come in to help themselves to us again. And so we are ripped off twice. We got to end this game. You got to ask the question, why is it that despite all of this so-called educational technology, despite all of the, uh, the, the sophisticated thinking and learning, we're never able to solve problems we, uh, in, uh, that black people face? The answer to it, of course, is that the problem must continue to exist. We have to end domination. The educational establishment is a part of that system. There are a lot of people who like to take education out of the mix. No, no, no. The educational establishment is as much a part of the system of domination as is any other establishment in this system. There is no exception. It is a major establishment. Racial domination and ruling class supremacy are institutions. The principal functions of institutions is self-perpetuation. Any minor sociology course will tell you that institutions live to do what? Perpetuate themselves and to expand themselves. And to do that, they they issue ideologies that justify their existence and they generate evidence to justify their, uh, their existence and which, to, and which justifies the necessity for their existence. This is the basic role of institutions. You see, one of the benefits of power is 
that you can project an ideology that justifies your reason for having it. And then you can actually generate evidence which also can be used to justify your reason. You see? And you got to look at the fact then that the system generates its evidence. And we, we, I talked to you about that in, 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 in black on black violence. We rule over black people because they're innately criminal. We rule over black people because they have difficulty learning. You see? Therefore, we have these establishments and programs and everything, and they exist to deal with these issues and problems. But watch out. It's the very institutions and programs that also do what? Generate the problem. You see? And create the problem. I told you about the power of, of, of projection in black-on-black -black violence. The white man projects his criminality onto black people. You see? And it's he who is not the criminal, but black people who are the criminal. And when you combinate that projection with his power, that projection process becomes a process of what? Creation. Because when he believes that you're a criminal, when he believes that you're innately less intelligent, his power over the purse, his power to control the conditions under which we live, will mean then that he will control the purse in line with his belief and control the conditions in such a way that they will actually begin to create criminality and learning problems in reality. And then he will go out and document the existence of criminality and the existence of learning problems and say this is the reason why we must be in the position that we are in. And even the victims themselves then will go along with it because they say, well, they have empirical evidence to back up what they say. <laughs> Not realizing that the empirical evidence has been generated and created through a power process. Because, you see, that's all left out. And there's nowhere we are taught in our schools and places to see the processes that takes place. And therefore, we are overwhelmed by statistics and so forth. White supremacy has been and is institutionalized in any number of ways. Its institutions are designed to serve its exploitative interests. The educational establishment is one of the major institutions of white supremacy. And its educational ideologies and practices are designed to justify its existence and to provide adjunctive support for white domination and to degenerate the ev evidentiary conditions which support both its existence, that is the educational establishment, and the existence of the system of which it is an integral part. In fact, educational ideology and practice are potent creators of the material conditions and evidence which maintains and support the white supremacist system, the very ideology itself. You have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, the role of ideology. You have to look at the fact that this system is a system of inequality. It is a culture of inequality. One of the things that characterizes this system is inequality between individuals and people. Where certain people have billions of dollars and others have nothing. How do you justify that idea? How do you justify that situation? And this is the role of the white intellectual establishment to justify white wealth and power and white poverty uh, and black uh, powerlessness and poverty. To justify white wealth and power in the world and African poverty and powerlessness in the world. You see. And what is the ideology then that this system projects to justify itself? It projects the ideology of individualism. Yes. And the ideology, as I have said earlier, of familialism. That is, that people are in the position that they're in as a result of individual defects and deficiencies. Not as a result of power relations between groups. 
Not as a result of warfare and enslavement and domination. Not as a result of exclusion from economic activity and so forth, but because they have something wrong with their minds and their brains and with their personalities, you see. And that is why they are where they are. In the older days, it used to be that they had a problem with their moral sense. And that's why in the early days of social work, the people went out trying to preach to the poor lessons in morality. Just as old Dan Quell is trying to preach lessons in values. As if you can eat values and morality. These people suffer from a lack of money and a lack of income and a lack of jobs. A lack of support from their government and their system. What else does a government exist for if it, is, if it does not exist to support its people? You understand? But they want to run a game and claim that it is an absence of values and an absence of morals and an absence of some kind of intangible idea that is the cause of people's material sufferings and misery. It is the absence of something within the people themselves. It is a deficiency operating in the family. And a lot of us fall for this nonsense. Well, we've got to deal with the family. And it starts in the family. It doesn't start in the family. The family is a part of a social political system. The African American family was a slave institution and it is still a slave institution. It was created during slavery time and even if it had a mama and a daddy and some kids, it was still a slave family. And that made it fundamentally different from the European family, even though in form it might have looked the same. But do not confuse form and substance. You must understand that. It's just not enough to have a mama and a daddy and some children and to claim that you have the same family as white folks' family. You're wrong. Because domination changes that situation. Because the black family, regardless of its com uh, composition, is a family in domination. And ultimately is a family that's designed to do what? Serve the interests of others. And despite its form, whether it has mama, daddy, and young babies, it is still in its fundamental nature being under the domination of another people in many ways still fundamentally different. And its interactions and relationships are shaped by those dominated, de denominational uh, dynamics. And you got to understand that, you see. And when domination requires that this family breaks up and falls apart, then that is what's going to happen to the family situation. That is why, in the end, you just can't solve the problems of African people by merely trying to deal with the African family. You must deal with the forces that shape that family. You must change the nature of the system that impacts on that family. Forces fathers out. Forces men to not have jobs so that they can't support families. One of the reasons why these black men here shy from responsibilities, you call it, ladies and gentlemen, is because they are not in the position economically to undertake it. It can be clearly demonstrated when the vast majority of black men have the economic wherewithal to undertake the support of their families, they involve themselves in families. And by the way, there's no such thing as the family anyway. There are a number of, of family forms. Black children, 75% or 80% of black children are raised in families. You understand? But that's another lecture. But these people float out individualism and the individual ideology. And, and, and it gets most pernicious then when we who are victims of it believe that philosophy of individualism. You see? And this goes, this is for any institution. Then what are we going to say then with this ideology of individualism, of familialism? We are suffering because there is something what? Wrong with us. We are suffering from what? Deficiencies. It is our fault. 
You, you know, you notice when we get in debates with white folk and we start talking about white folk and blaming them. Oh, there you go. Blaming white folk. You're blaming the system. You are the blame. Yes. And for your mental health, you should keep blaming them. Why should you take up on yourself self-blame? If it's the facts anyway. You see, but when you inculcate this ideology of individualism, then you must engage in what? Self-blame. Self-negation. You see, self-hatred. Self-alienation. Depression. You see? And when you look around and see all of those people who have your same color and of your same background, you begin to do a race number with it. You must believe then that it's endemic to the whole race. You see, then you lose your aspirations. Then you become apathetic. And then here come the white sociologists and their black followers. And they go in now and check your characteristic. These people uh, lack self-love. They lack self-esteem. They have low aspirations. They have low, you know, and one thing after another. And it is this so low self-esteem that is the cause of their problem. You see, it is their lack of, it's their alienation that is the cause of their problem. But how was this what? Generated. These people generate the problem and then, then, and then blame the, the problem for creating the problem. And many of us then will go along with it. But let me tell you something, and I'll end it soon here. We didn't get around to our subject matter, but we'll talk about it say some other time. Let me tell you about this business of ideology. It's so important. And I'm going to tell you that because, you see, we as people don't want to get into abstract thought. We, we, you must get out of this. You see, this business of, of ideology. Do you know what? The ruling class and ruling white supreme structure, supremacist structure, does not believe in individualism. It does not believe in it. Let me read you a quick quote of some of the things I'm writing now about power. Interestingly, the ideology of American individualism with which the wealthy and powerful European American community indoctrinates the subordinate African-American community is neither really accepted or practiced by that dominant community, especially its ruling elite. Neither does it actually accept or practice the ideology of the individualism, free market capitalism, into which it so skillfully socializes its lower classes and the African-American community. For the implicit acceptance and extreme practice of these ideologies, that is the ideology of individualism and free market, are individually isolating, overly competitive, and communally divisive. In other words, when we believe this ideology, it divides us, isolates us one from the other, puts us into direct competition one with the other and maintains division within the community in the name of good old American individualism so that a ruling class can manipulate us to its end. And therefore, this philosophy of individualism is impoverishing and disempowering, which is the reason they are foisted on the African American community. We are the only Americans in America we're the only ones who really believe American uh, ideology. I'm telling you, we are. We're the only people who believe this nonsense. The abiding characteristics of the culture of power and wealth are these. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, when you get off of studying our characteristics, I urge you to study the characteristics of people who rule you. And often you have to reverse these equations, you see, Instead of saying, what are the characteristics of the weak and the powerless? Why not ask, what are the characteristics of the powerful and the wealthy? Because that is what? Where we want 
to go. What is the nature of the organization of those who rule and control themselves and control the world? You understand? And this is what we'll be doing in the courses on power. We won't be talking about how we are victimized by power. We're going to talk about how we're going to victimize the victimizer. You see, in order for these people to rule us, they must create us in a mentality where we can't see the obvious. Where we can't see what is immediately in front of our face. That's the only way it can work. It must set us up in such a way that we'll spend tons of energy trying to dig under the establishment and see what they are doing. What kind of little conspiracy are they doing under here? We got a lot of people caught up in that, you know. Reading all kinds of books about this underground European conspiracy. Baby, it's the overground one that's working you. <laughs> Shoot. You know, I had a friend, you know, who said, you know, we're worried about the third eye and we can't even deal with the two we got. You know, that right here in our heads. We spend all day trying to locate the third eye. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But also, you know, these eyes were pretty here too, to see things. All right? Any intelligence agency will tell you that about 85% of its intelligence is gathered from standard popular publications. Yeah, just reading newspapers and magazines and journals. That only about 5% of intelligence and of important intelligence is gathered by some secret underground type of stuff. Most of it is what? Right up front. Right in front. We must gain the capacity to see what's right in front of us. And I tell you, these Europeans reveal themselves to us every day. All the time. One of our greatest powers we have is the European, his whole plan for ruling and everything is right there. We can reach right out and get it. What are the characteristics of, of this? Oh boy, yeah, I'm gonna. What are the characteristics? These are not individualists. That's what I'm trying to show you here. What are the characteristics of, of this? Oh boy, yeah, I'm gonna. What are the characteristics? These are not individualists. That's what I'm trying to show you here. A class, community, and ethnic consciousness. Those people who rule know that they're in the ruling class. They know one another. They identify with one another. They hang out with one another. They go to school with one another. You understand? But that's the opposite of what they tell you. You know, stay separate, be on your own, move on your own, and follow your own thing. What is the other thing they have? Wealth. Money. Not just values, but what? Money. Money. That's what you need to rule in this world. But see, they're going to leave you with this moral nonsense. Control of social and political and other important institutions necessary for reaching group, group goals and for realizing group values. What? They have institutions, colleges, universities, think tanks, as you're mentioning here, you see. Political organizations and institutions so that they can reach the goals that they make for themselves. But they tell the poor that they can achieve what they want through individual salvation, as I occurred to, as we talked about earlier. You see, they go to exclusive colleges and universities. And they build the universities for themselves to work for them. And they send their people to those universities. And then they tell us we can go anywhere we feel like it and we shouldn't build universities specifically designed for our interests. And so the highest achievement we can make is to go to all kinds of places all over the place without having places that we have created in our own interests. You understand? But they create their universities. I've told you time and time again. I see people here who come to these conferences talking about it takes, it took the Egyptian priest 40 years or whatever to be complete in their education. And yet these same people think that they can educate black people with two hour lectures every weekend. Huh? Yeah, that's right. You think you can just hear a lecture on Saturday and that's going to give you enough of what you need to overturn this system? But ladies and gentlemen, what do you think 
These, how long do you think these people go to school in America? They have institutions open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they take their people through these institutions for 30 and 40 years so that they can rule the world. Do you understand? And we have to understand then that we have to have our own institutions and we must put our people through the years of training necessary so that we can meet these people on their own terms and deal with them. And that means then that you must have political and social institutions over which you have control. And you remember I told you before, when I see you sitting in these churches, when I see you 15 and 20 years without a building and without anything that you have control on, when the janitor of that church comes in and flicks lights on and off and tells you it's time to go, regardless of what you have to talk about and what you have to do, then you can't be totally sincere about overthrowing the system that rules you. You can't be sincere about it. Mm -mm. A number one, you must have control of your time. That's right. I can tell you whether a person has real grasp, has a real grasp of the problem that confront African people by the time they give you to talk about the problem. You see? And it indicates then, they, they often indicate that they have no grasp of the problem. You see? Because they say, well, you got an hour, you got 45 minutes. You know, something like that. And the same thing goes in the school. I've told you before that in these schools, black people, are, uh, children are torn up by the time system. Because you have inherited a system from another people. That time system is organically related to them, their goals, their history and experience. That time system in these public schools is not your time system. And this time system destroys our people. Do you know how you feel when you're late? What happens to your body? How you, your heart beats? How your blood pressure rises? And you notice the physiological changes your body undergoes just in terms of the time situation? You notice how you start getting nervous, anxious? How when you're sitting in an exam, that stopwatch is up there ticking away and you lose your memory? And you lose your thought and organization? This is what happens then when you let another people set the time for you. When you operate in their time system, that time system will destroy you physiologically and mentally. It will destroy your mentality, your memory, and your capacity to think. You confuse that with a lack of ability. You ever notice once you get out of the exam how all your stuff comes back to you? Yeah, which means then that, that you didn't lose knowledge, you didn't even lose the memory. You lost the capacity to do what? Under the pressure of time to what? Retrieve it. And to appropriately organize the memory, you see. So if you want your children to appropriately remember, to organize their thought, to organize their behavior, you see, then you must provide them with an appropriate time system. A system that recognizes their history, their experiences, their goals, and so forth, and then organizes their time within that construct. You gotta throw out these time systems that these people have given you. You gotta throw out these time systems that this society lays on you. You gotta throw out these time systems that they put you on radio. You know, I hear a lot of people complain, all we have, to do, all we hear is people analyzing the problem over and over again. You know why? It's not that often the people don't have the solutions. But often you must set up the analysis of the problem so people can see how the solution is logically related to the analysis. But since you have bought white folks radio time, right, and you go on air time when they tell you to go on air time, and you go on news time when they go on news time, you see, in other words, you've inherited a radio system that's ba and a time system in radio that will vitiate your capacity to stick with your people long enough so that you can work from start to finish. 
You see, are we bought this idea that a guest can only appear once? There's sometimes the guests may have to appear for a whole week. You see, I may have to stay for two straight hours. You see, so that the people can be truly educated. The radio stations and the media must be organized in their time sequences in terms of what we must accomplish as a people. They are not there principally to sell ads. They must be there to educate the people. And therefore, they must provide the time necessary for that education to take place. That is why we need an independent, non-commercial radio and TV. So that we can give the kind of time we need to solve our problem as a people. And you have to understand this kind of situation and understand what is happening. So these people organize their time, they organize their institution. This is what ruling peoples do. You see, they, 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 have, they control the government. African people, you must shoot for the control of the American government. That's why I'm advocating a black party, an independent black party. Yes. Yes. I know some Negroes are saying immediately, well, you never win the president. I don't give a hoot about the presidency. Jesse Jackson could have been a far more powerful leader if he'd given up running for the presidency and decided to truly represent black people in this world. He would have been able to influence presidents and to dictate to presidents because he would have had the power of black people behind him. And ultimately, the power is not sitting on the throne. The power is behind the throne. Electoral politics is not governance. Simply because you're voting someone into office doesn't mean you're engaged in government and that you're engaged in the governance process. We got a lot of jokers selling voting. Every time people call up on the radio, every problem that black people suffer from is because they don't vote. If you would vote, get out of here. Ask the basic question. Look at the major victories of black people. Were they attained by voting? Huh? Did we vote in order to get the vote? Then why are we being so voting as the chief solution to the problems of African American people? You know why you're being so voting as the chief problem for African American people? Because the bourgeois class that rules us, and I'm speaking now of the black bourgeois class, okay? You see, you gotta learn the principles of domination. <laughs> I'm telling you, one thing that the dominating class does is to make those who are dominated think that the interests of those who dominate are their interests. And that they can, and make the dominated think that they can only achieve their interests. They play with money. And what they did, swap the industries that already exist between each other and just generated false wealth. Not building, not investing. As a matter of fact, that crew took its tax savings, engaged in leveraged buyouts, indebted its corporations to no end, uh, created massive debt in the nation, and then had the nerve to deindustrialize America and ship its industries outside of the country. And then they sold us equal opportunity, equal rights, and equal employment, 
and they include in their ads, this is an equal opportunity company. But you know what? The company's not even in America. <laughs> And the, and the way the companies are, the people don't even have those kind of laws. You can't even get in them. And that's the nature of this beast, you see. They're going to pass all these laws, and when you get ready to execute them, you'll find out that the, that the factories and things that they were supposed to execute it for are no longer there. So now you got the laws on the book, but you're in worse shape than you were before. And so it told, and Reagan then told the American people that if you support the interests of the rich, then they will solve your problems. And now they're learning here in 1992 that their problems have multiplied. And you're going to find that this is the case with any bourgeois class. It's going to tell the dominated that they will solve their problems or the lower classes by supporting the interests of the ruling group or the bourgeois class. The bourgeois class that rules us has to a great extent gained its wealth and prestige through the electoral process. They have gained elective office. They have gained beautiful contracts, set-asides, and they've gained access to some industry and ownership of various resources, okay? And then they want to tell us and the masses of African people that if they support their electoral interest, which will put them into office, which will permit them to operate within the Democratic Party, that it in some way or other is going to advance the interests of the masses of African people. And therefore, then, we are so voting, and we are made to think that the election of one of these people represents an advancement for the race. Okay? And we think enriching one or two of them will give us a vicarious pleasure while we starve to death out here in the street and are homeless. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. You got to get ready for revolution. Yeah. They then set up a set of social relations. They control community resources. These people that rule control what? Resources. That's the essence of power. A control of resources. A control of institutions. Wealth. You understand? A class consciousness. An ethnic consciousness. An identity one with the other. They control their resources, they socialize their own children, they educate their own children, they train their own children, they create the institutions in which this socialization and education and training takes place. This is what ruling groups do. That's why they create their exclusive schools, prep schools, graduate schools, and other kind of things, and why they tell you you should go and scatter yourself among all of these other institutions. They have an ideology of group superiority, of group worthiness, and an overwhelming desire to be free and independent, and a drive for hegemony, a drive to rule, and to be in control of themselves. They control superior coercive force. That's how they differ. They're in control of what? The army, the police force, and in control of power. So when you finally get totally out of hand, they're going to bring in what? the National Guard and the Army and so forth. If you're going to be a powerful people, then you must control what? Superior coercive forces, superior physical forces, control real power in that regard so that you can maintain yourself and deal with other people. This is what power is about, you see. And these people express a willingness to fully and effectively use them to achieve and defend their group interest. You want power? This is the way you got to go. There's no other way. Pleading to some people's moral side, to their humanity, and all this other nonsense ain't going to get it. 
you have to realize then as I wind it up, you see, that this European is set to continue to rule over us. And while we may, and I'm sorry I didn't get around to special ed tonight, I'll get around to it another night here. Because you remember, in order for this society to rule, it must disenable us mentally. It's a political economic requirement that black people be mentally crippled in order for the system to exist. It is a requirement then that the methods that this system generates in its effort to so-called treat these disabilities must contribute to the problem or must not resolve the problem fully. We must understand ourselves as a people. You must get out of this idea that black children come to school behind, already behind. There's no such thing as children coming to school behind anybody. They come to school as they are. They come to school at the point where their culture has uh, bought them. They're not behind. They are who they are. They reflect their cultural experience. They are where they should be in terms of their actual experience and circumstance. But as soon as you see them as coming behind and entering the school behind somebody, as soon as you see them as disadvantaged when they enter the school, you're already in trouble and you've already mentally set yourself up to destroy them. One of these nights I'm going to talk to you about oral culture because, you know, we are an oral people, you see, and you got to understand that culture deeply and the effect it has on thinking and the effect it has on behavior, you see, and you have to recognize that, that how it expresses itself in thought forms and in, in, in uh, speech forms. The oral culture and the oral orientation develops out of face-to-face -face cultures. You see, I was talking to a teacher here last week when she was telling uh, me that I teach my students to, say, to speak in complete sentences. If they stumble on somebody's toe, I tell them to say, sorry, I am, so I am sorry, so-and-so, for stepping on your toe. You know, that's fine. And, and, and instead of just saying what? Sorry, <laughs> okay. However, I'm not condemning her teaching this. In fact, this should be taught, but it's not what you teach as much as the reason for which you teach it, you see. But that is an oral orientation because that oral orientation is one where people operate in small groups and face-to-face -face groups. You see, and in a society that pretty much still has us locked into small groups so that the people we communicate with, we generally know very well. And, 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 there, and we share a history and experience such that we can say one word and they understand a ton of things. You see, and this is the nature of oral culture, you see. And they can say sorry because everybody saw that you stepped on the person's foot. They know whose foot you stepped on. They know who you are and the whole business. So you say, say, say sorry. But the other parts of the sentence are what? Implied. You see? Now, when you move into a literate culture, that culture is a culture designed for people to communicate over distance. It's essentially designed for communication between strangers and between people who've never met each other, seen each other, who do not share a common background. Therefore, it requires elaborated uh, uh, speech skills and descriptive skills and more precision in expression because you've got to supply much more of this in order that the person understands what you're talking about. You see, you have to understand this then. When these children walk into the school, you must understand they are not linguistically deficient. There's nothing wrong with their language. You understand? 
their language reflects the kind of social environment in which they operate, and it functions efficiently in that environment. They're not behind anybody. They have no neurological defects. They have no problems with their brain. Even the standard psychologist will tell you that 80% of the children who are diagnosed as learning disabled are mixed diagnosed. I'm telling you. But a lot of it is because people do not know the culture and history of the children they're dealing with. And they misinterpret those children. Now then, when you deal with these children and you know that experience, then you know that your place as a teacher there is to meet that child where that child is. And that you are now to take that child across a bridge into new ways of thinking because now it must confront people who think in a different sort of way. And it must not reject its way of thinking, but it must add on to it and efficiency with new forms of thinking so that it can appropriately deal with people who think in that way and can operate efficiently in their world in terms of its interests. Not because they're going to work for them one day, but because they are going to work them one day. <laughs> okay? You got to look at the culture that we're talking about. You have to understand the psychohistory of these children and the psychohistory of African people. That psychohistory then meant, means that the way people think reflects their level of social activity and their social and, and, and economic political role in society. You understand? And therefore, their thought patterns will tend to be correlated with their work patterns and habits and with the roles that they play in the society. That's why I tell you, job discrimination did not only block black people from making money. It also meant that the kind of thinking styles that were attached to various types of jobs were not inculcated into black people because they did not have the responsibilities of those jobs. And it meant then, not having the responsibilities of those jobs, they were unable subliminally and otherwise to pass on to their children the thought patterns connected with those jobs. So ultimately, job discrimination was a way of manipulating and creating a mentality in black people and a thought style in black people. Then you ask for assimilation and entered then into a school system that took certain thought styles for granted and even thought those thought styles came up as a matter of pure development. And when it did not see and does not see these thought styles in your children, it then will evaluate them as being defective, you see, and being deficient. No, they are not. They are not deficient at all. It means then that the school systems themselves must be reorganized. One of the major functions of learning disabilities, uh, the learning disabilities establishment, besides the fact that each learning disabled child is worth $7,000 a year to each school. You understand? $7,000 a year. The number of so-called learning disabled doubled within very short years. This learning disabilities orientation is worth over 13 to 15 billion dollars to the American educational establishment. What did I say earlier? The people are invested in our so-called disabilities. School systems depend on our having these disabilities, ladies and gentlemen. That's why in the end, you've got to change the nature of school organization. 
And you got to organize these schools in line with your psychology as a people and in line of where you want to go as a people. That means a thorough African-centered education is not only an education that is based upon the history and experience of African people. It recognizes that that history and experience of African people has created in us certain thought style orientations. It has created in her certain learning styles. You understand? We have been conditioned into thinking and learning in certain sort of ways. So then when we enter into other institutions where people have been conditioned in thinking in other ways, we are put at a so-called disadvantage. So then it means an African-centered theory must develop a theory of learning and a theory of thinking. How do African American people think? How do African American people learn? You gotta work this out, you see. Then it must develop a, an, a, 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 a theory of pedagogy, a theory of teaching. How must our children be taught given their thought and learning styles and motivational styles in a way that they can become the people we need for them to be in order for us to achieve our liberation. You see, and this is where we have to go. One other thing on top, one other thing on top of that, besides dealing with our so-called disabilities, we must look at education in terms of the problems we have to solve as black people. And let me tell you, we face some enormous problems. The economic bad news is gonna really come out after the elections. This economic system is in very, very bad shape. It is also, even if it recovers, going to be fundamentally restructured. You think that our people are suffering because they lack job training? In fact, I think they have an ad in last Sunday's paper. It may, uh, may not be here. And, oh yeah, here it is, in last Sunday's paper here, a cartoon. It says, the first thing says, all I need is a job. And then there's another person that steps in there, the professional type. What you need is job retraining. Then he has him studying job retraining. He's writing and scribbling and he's learning. And the, fine, and the other one then has him handling, handing him a job re retraining certificate. Okay? And the last panel has him saying what? Now all I need is a job. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, when you try and you call yourself training these children for jobs, when the jobs don't even exist, white management is being wiped out. Management jobs, white collar jobs are being wiped out. This country is being deindustrialized. What jobs are you saying that you're trying to get your children to be educated for? Are you kidding? You must now educate your children to create jobs. Yes. You must educate these children into geography. You must educate them into mineralogy. You must educate them into international trade. You see? So that we can build up trade with the Caribbean, with Central and South America, and build up trade with the African continent. We must have Africans owning Africa shipping to America, and this must be shipped through African hands in America itself. That's right. And the reason why we want power in this country, we want the power to manipulate U.S. foreign policy. Okay? We want the power to make African countries most favored nations in America. We want, the, we want the power so that the African manufacturer can have access to the American market. 
because we know that it's not the Africans cannot manufacture and technologically develop themselves unless they have markets to sell to. And, and this large African-American population in America must make one of the largest markets in the world, which is even expanding with the addition of Mexico and Canada. We must make this market open to African manufacture and African technology. And, and, and we must educate our people then to advance the technological development of Africa, the manufacturing development of Africa, and we must organize the American economy so that they will have a market to sell to. You understand? And this is what power is about. I warned you the last time I was here that we are caught up in unrealistic expectations. And I told you the last time, every time I see a Negro stand up, he talks about black and Latino. And we got a bunch of people here who want to carry the whole world on their backs even though they can't walk on their own two feet. You better learn something about reality. These people are going to ride your back until they are able to walk on their own feet and they're going to turn around on you. There's no love between, between a people. There are interests between people. And they coalesce when their interests coalesce. But when their interests don't coalesce, the love affair is over, man. So the people who may operate with you today may be your enemy tomorrow. And you have to work on that. After I told you that in this month's Atlantic Magazine, what do we have here? Immigration in the New American Dilemma. Blacks versus brown. You read about the high school over here in Brooklyn. You know what's going on over there. There was another piece in the New York Times today about this major fight over the black superintendent of schools in LA. Ethnic politics, very strong. I heard a new thing on LIB, but they didn't go into the details of how the Latinos put up a tremendous fight over this man's appointment and the kind of things that they said about it. If you checked Town 13 about two or three weeks ago, you would have seen the organization out there that says, we are no longer going to help the blacks and we are no longer going to hook into the whites and the Jews. We are going for ourselves. We are 60 percent of, uh, of, of Los Angeles, and we are no longer going to be told what piece of the pie we are going to get. We are going to tell how the pie is going to be cut. Okay? That's the way the deal goes down, ladies and gentlemen. You're dealing here with the population that's rapidly growing, and that at the rate it's growing, we'll have the West Coast right on down through Texas and New Mexico, and we'll engage in trade interactions with Central and South America, build its wealth and power in America by its direct interaction with those countries and use those countries' power and influence in the world to support their own power and influence in America. Do you understand what we're talking about here? And then you got another group that will work itself down the East Coast from New York City through Washington, D.C. Before you know anything, you'll be landlocked. You've got to get your own territory, and you've got to get control of your own situation. You've got to get into export and import relationships with Africa and, and with, with Central and South America, where Africans are, to advance your own interests and your own prosperity. And in order to do this, you must educate your children specifically to accomplish this. And in order to do this, they must be educated specifically in the business. As I told people, I'm tired of these little courses, how to run a small business, how to, how to write a business plan. To hell with the business plan, I need money. To hell with the general course on business. Why? Because the immigrants have an informal education system. They educate their children by them being in the stores with them. 
They know how to stock based because they see it going all the time. They know how to make the register because they work it all the time. They know who the wholesalers are because they see their fathers going there to those sellers time and time again. Do you understand? Now, for people who don't have these kind of businesses in abundance, they cannot educate their children in terms of apprenticeship. It means then that our children have to be formally educated and motivated, but they have to be educated specifically how to run a fruit stand, how to run a grocery store, how to run a hardware store, who are the wholesalers, how you negotiate with a wholesaler, you understand? Specific information so that we can specifically take over the world. One other thing, stop needing love from other people. Settle down for the fact that we're going to have 20 to 25 years of racial tension. I tell audiences today, and I'm going to tell you tonight, I didn't come here to bring racial harmony. I came here tonight to increase racial tension. Because I know one thing, when the other races are on your back, if you are to stand up, you got to throw them off. And if you're going to have control of your resources, you got to run them out. And you got to get used to the idea that they're going to call you everything but a child of God. They're going to accuse you of reverse racism. They're going to lay everything on you when you move them out. But you got to move them out anyway. And you got to move forward. Good night. Thank you very much.